You ready to rock and roll, my friend? Yeah, hold on one sec. So we're recording as Matt gets ready. The A um, couple weeks ago, and this is probably the fourth or fifth interview that I've done here on Zoom since that function. Listeners, you wouldn't have heard it, but when I hit record, it says, "You, this meeting is being recorded. And it always sounds so odd to me. It makes me laugh every single time. I haven't gotten used to it yet. I actually just got it myself. But uh, Matt, welcome back to the show. And for those of you watching on YouTube and those of you listening in the introduction, I will um, mention the previous episode number. I don't have it off the top of my head. When when Matt was previously on the show, I had read and, and shared his book, Sway. And it was, uh, I don't know the right word, a powerful, awesome um I don't even know the right word, but it, it, it just hit me hard. And so I reached out to Matt personally and he responded and I had him on the show. It was a, you know, a, a great interview, the book itself. But Matt, for those of you hearing you for the first time, this interview is going to take a different direction. It's part of your story. But for those just listening now, can you give us like maybe a two or three minute rundown of who you are, kind of a synopsis maybe of the book Sway, because obviously I want to re recommend that book to, to the listeners now. But can you kind of summarize who you are and your story? Yeah, yeah. It's first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Um, I, uh, my name is Matt Bocci. Um, my story is based around, in, in a lot of ways, losing my dad in 9-11 and the irreparable effects that it had on my life in my, especially my early childhood and adolescence. Um, but my dad worked on 154 of the North tower. And, uh, when he died, I was fascinated with trying to figure out how he died. And for me, the question that seemed to always come up was, did he jump? And so at about 10 years old, I started to look at all this footage of people who were jumping from the building, people hanging out of the towers, things like that. Um, that vulnerability led to me being sexually abused by someone in my family. Um, and then I went down a path of, of, of drug and alcohol abuse, mainly drugs for many years. Um, and I've been sober for nearly six years now, but um, it took a lot of hardship to get there. Um, a lot of strength, but uh, every single time I would fall, I would manage to pick myself back up. And that's sort of the resounding theme of my story, I think is, to always get back up, to try to always get back up. Um, and, and I think that can be said for a lot of people. And that type of message can be impactful for a lot of people too. Yeah, man. And it is. And like I said, for, for me personally, I read the book and it, it was one of those books that it's, it's so cliche to say it's hard to put down, but it really and truly was hard to put down. And then to talk to you, I kind of feel this way when I read books about military people, right? That, that, go through such tra traumatic experiences and then they come back and write about it and talk about it. And then you realize, oh, these are regular people. Like this is a person like you, like you're a dude just like me. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. And it really personalizes and makes you realize, wow, these people going through these extremely difficult things, they're human beings and they're real people. It's not a a movie, right? It's your real life. And that to me was one of the most impactful things about that book is then getting to know you and talking to you just like I talked to my friends. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, people sort of view military people or people who go through traumatic experiences or even 9-11, you know, it was such a sensationalized event um, with this like mystique or like something like that, you know, like they, they, they don't associate them as being everyday people right well if you saw me walking on the street 99 percent of the time you wouldn't know who i am and you wouldn't know what i went through and honestly i wouldn't really want you to know all that stuff uh, i i get pretty vulnerable and, and open when i'm talking about my story and whatnot but um i think i come across as like your regular average person right so uh if you saw me walking down the street i don't think you'd be like oh there's you know the kid who lost his dad 9 11 which is how i used to feel i was labeled for many years yeah, you're 100 percent correct. You're, to me, so if you're not watching the video, you know Matt's down. He's DTS. He's down the shore, <laughs> and uh, you just look like a dude who's down the shore enjoying yourself. Yeah. And and when you talk to you, when you read the book, if, you know listeners, if you listen to that previous episode, and for those of you on YouTube, just Google Matt Bocci Spaniard Show, the B O C C H I, it'll come up. It, that is the truth. But beneath that is 
so much knowledge and so much experience and so much insight. And this is where we're going to take a detour from the last interview. So the last interview was about your book, about your life story. And probably a week and a half ago, uh, you, you have started speaking and, and we've just talked, uh, you know, informally about speaking virtual in person, et cetera, all aspects of it. And then I asked you your perspective on, on some stuff that I was listening to as relates to drugs, because mm -hmm. one of the, one of the kind of, I'll call it a benefit for me having this show and, or just being a curious person is I can live the experiences of other people without having lived them myself. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm me and with my experiences, but I can ask you, Matt, about your experiences and those experiences revolve around drugs. And I'm, you know, I, I, I've just always been afraid of drugs. I've always been afraid of getting in trouble. I've always been afraid of death. I've just been just hyper afraid of trouble, right? So I've always steered clear of, of drugs, but I'm so, I've learned so much in the last several years about psych psychedelics, about uh, cannabis, about uh, CBD, about uh, all of these things, because it's culturally becoming much different than it was before. And so you and I started this conversation and I was like, whoa, let's hit pause and save this for a recording because the things you were saying, the ex like the, fir the firsthand knowledge, it's one thing for me to read it from a book, but then for you to say, yes, that, and I experienced X, Y, Z. It, it, it's incredible. So that is the focus of the show in an whatever way is that drugs. And I don't know where it's going to go exactly, but <laughs> you are, you've been on the front lines when it comes to that. Yeah. So what, what was your introduction into drugs? And I'm using drugs as a general term and you'll get into the specific things that you've done over the years and the effects and the, the, different types of highs and the expenses, all of your experiences. But what was your introduction to, to drugs as the average kid or the average young man? Well, uh, okay. So as a kid, pretty much a lot of people around me were prescribed Adderall, Ritalin, things like that. Right. As a lot of, you know, unfortunately there's this, there's this tendency for doctors to put these little kids who are dealing with, any little issue on these medications. Okay. Well, I was a class clown. I had horrible ADHD, distracting people in class, tapping on the desk, whistling in class, just not the best behaved student, but I was a good student. So my doctor, I, I think I was probably like 11, 12 years old around that age. Um, they wanted to put me on one of those medications. I didn't want to take it. One of my brothers was taking it. He didn't like the way it made him feel. So he stopped. So as a kid, really no introduction to prescription drugs. Um, I smoked weed for the first time. Uh, I was about, I think I was like 15, maybe 15 years old. I had like my first experience with it. Didn't really get high. And then 16, 17, I was smoking more, um, drinking alcohol. I started drinking alcohol when I was 14. As a maybe 110, 15, 20 pound kid soaking wet, I was pretty drunk off four beers. Um, I was at an eighth grade graduation party. And I remember like throwing up in the bathroom and I was like, oh, this is terrible. Like I, I didn't have the experience that I would later find with harder drugs in the sense of finding that relief that I was looking for. Um, and so when I got to college, my freshman year at Villanova, I was pledging a fraternity and I couldn't keep up with, with my grades. Um, I couldn't keep up with school. I had early classes, late nights, pledging, whatever. Um, I, I couldn't keep up with the schedule. So some kid gives me an Adderall. He gives me a, a 30 milligram instant release Adderall pill. It was orange. Um, I think it was instant release. I take the pill, swallow it. And, um, and I remember like 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes later, just like having this, like sort of like a rush and, and, and Adderall in its truest sense is like a methamphetamine. It, it is literally like crystal meth at its truest core. And what um, is that? So can you explain that? What, meaning what? It, it, crystal meth is made in like shady labs. Like, you know, 
best way I can, you know, to, that many people will know, like Breaking Bad, right? Yeah. So um, it's made in labs 99% of the time illegally. And actually back in like the 18, late 1800s, like the Germans were actually like, and, and into like the Nazi regime, they were making crystal meth, right? So uh, these drugs were accessible to, to the everyday person. And initially actually the Nazi, and I'm going to go on a tangent, but no, the Nazi, yeah, I'll, I'll accompany your tangent. Cause I'm, yeah, no, like the Nazis were so anti this drug use, right? The first drug, I forget the name of it. It's something that starts with a P and it was a pill that was, ba it wasn't Percocet, Pervidi or something like that. And it was a, an opiate and people could get these pills, right? They go to the pharmacy and get these pills. The Nazis were so against that. Um, same type of deal with like cocaine was being accessible too. Um, and then, but then there's, there's yeah. a story and I don't know if you're, uh, are you, were you going to touch more on the Nazi thing or no? I was going to talk about the fact that they start, they started to realize once they got there, like once they actually, they were so anti doing those drugs. And then when they started doing them and they realized how much better it made them feel, how invincible they, it made yeah. them feel, how clear headed in some ways in terms of like, I mean, I don't even want to know, but they were openly doing them and, and there's a so was hitler yeah there was a story with that that i initially heard on rogan's podcast and then he vetted it so i i'm after vetting i'm, I'm yeah assuming it's accurate they they found out a line but there's a story of a meeting between mussolini and hitler where he's all high on whatever that drug is that yeah that, that we're trying to figure you're trying to figure out what it is and that like helping shape the course of history yeah and, and, and it's just baffling if you think about it but it's like you know, we're, we're here in the 21st century and we are dealing with the biggest opioid epidemic we've ever had realistically. And this stuff was going on year, so many years ago, right? Like, th like these drugs were being used and, and there were so many doctors in Germany themselves that were addicted to all this stuff. Like it was just, it, it was overwhelming. And I, there's this book that I read called Blitzed and that book went into so many of the things that I am referring to now because you know, any, any sort of like drug memoir, things like that, that I, I like to read those types of stories because I like to hear people's stories of, of resilience and getting through it and being in recovery. But that offered a different insight that I never had really tapped into before. Um, fact of the matter is like heroin was created by, um, by uh, Bayer, right? Bayer, is that one of the, 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 yeah. And it was used for like, children and like things on children and stuff like for headaches and like basic pain stuff like something like that and it, it's just so crazy um and i can go into many different tangents on this so i won't but you know the war on drugs and all that stuff and all, all these things right and and i want to throw in a couple random things from the past i forget what podcast i heard it on but uh, you know it's not just a podcast but it's you know out there but it, i mean cocaine used to be in coke in coke yeah the drink coke and then yeah it has to do with I don't I think it was earlier than the prohibition, but it has to do with you know it was it, it, there it, it's a connection. I wish I remember the podcast name because they have a really awesome. It's like the story of businesses. They have a really cool one on Ke the Kellogg Company as well. Right. It has to do with cocaine being in the drink Coke, and then it has to do with uh, meta, the guy who created it. Then uh, was kind of a. Um, a shyster or a, a conniving whatever and created like medicine all these like different types of ointments and salves and uh whatever's and and it evolved has something to do with wine not getting the details correct but it's a yeah. if you just google cocaine yeah coca-cola it's a yeah. fascinating story yeah it is and then they started using like and then they switched over to like it was carbonated and then uh like with the, the pure cane sugar and stuff too and like because people were like drinking literally pure coke yeah and yeah it's there's so many stories like that that i find so fascinating and it's interesting and and then we can go into whatever direction you want to take it but what you mentioned there you know it, it's kind of like now politically if if you think a thing you're automatically that right yeah and yeah. with drugs it's like it it can't there can be shades right like when i shattered my eye socket they gave me morphine like you can take shades of a drug and it do you good painkillers if used properly can kill pain and help you recover but that can be a slippery slope 
and it is a slippery slope for some people. And and I completely agree. And the reason we got on this tangent was the Adderall thing. So I'll tap back to that in a sec. But going on that note real quick, um, Oxycontin, the original Oxycontin produced by Purdue Pharma, at its core, if, if they actually had what they ended up doing after years of people abusing these drugs, these pills, if they had actually made these pills um, with the adherence that they had down the road where they, you literally couldn't do anything to the pill. You couldn't break it down. You couldn't crush it, snort it, inject it, and smoke it, nothing. Um, if they had done that initially, fundamentally, what they were trying to do was actually what, what could have been beneficial to people. People who had chronic pain and other sort of injuries were taking 10 to 12 Percocets or Vicodin a day. And a Percocet has oxycodone plus Tylenol. Okay, um, so I want to backtrack because I'm pretty naive and green. But, yeah. but when you're saying opiates and when you're saying oxycodone, like those categories of drugs. So Percocet and oxycodone or oxycontin. Cotton. That, that's the same is that the same type of drug that we're talking about yeah so i'm actually looking up one thing because i want to make sure that i don't want to get it wrong but um i don't know if that's a, is it appropriate for me to do this yeah okay so okay so yeah like I, I was right so um you have the opium plant and you have opiates as a whole opioids as a whole and under that you have all these things that branch off of it right and they're synthetic opiates which are oxycodone which is just pure oxy oxycotton which was the brand name for okay oxycodone that was supposed to be time released and put with the little seal on it which addicts like myself slowly but surely figured out if you suck the coat the coating off of it and just wipe it off on your shirt and you, and there's always stories of people having streaks of colors on their shirts like usually green because once you got it, that coating off it would be a white pill and you'd crush that down and that would be, and what many people were using were 80 milligram pills, 80 milligrams of straight oxy. That's essentially three oxycodone, 30 milligram pills in one pill. Uh, at my height with those pill, with oxys themselves, they're also known as blues because they're most of the time blue tint color. Um, I was doing up to 30 of them a day. And how, how many dollars is that? Because I, I it like blows my mind. Yeah. So, I mean, listen, I didn't take... A traditional route with it okay uh if i was buying them on the street from someone who if i was in a decent enough neighborhood let's say or if i was in manhattan i'd be paying 25 and this is at my peak of addiction uh 25 to 30 and at times 35 dollars per pill now what i was doing was i i took out the middleman i didn't want to deal with any of that so i would drive to bad neighborhoods and i had I had numerous dealers and I would spend at that point 15 to 18, sometimes maximum $20 a pill. So regardless, still spending up to $600 a day. Um, granted I was selling them that also helped some, with some of that, but um, there are many times where I couldn't get the money and I did other things and we can talk about that too. But, um, but yeah, it's an expensive habit. And, and can you, all right, so we have the opium plant. Yeah. The different types of opioids. And if I'm, yeah. if I use wrong words, just tell me. Yeah. Um, part of those is, is what are painkillers, what, what we think of as uh, Percocet, oxycodone, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then it, like, does heroin come from that? Yeah. Heroin is branched. Well? Yeah. Heroin, morphine, um, heroin is, I, believe is metabolized in the body as morphine anyway so when you have like a drug test and then the, it's like the 12 panel drug test most of the time you're going to see oxy oxy you're going to see opi opiates and so if you're not popping on a drug test for oxy you are going to be popping for heroin morphine and it's really you know they go hand in hand yeah. um now, now that, uh, granted, I've been sober for almost six years. So for me, fentanyl was not prevalent at the time. That is now added on the drug test now. And they have strips now. You can test pills. And this is the way things are going in a way I think is, is, is great in, in the sense of how 
the healthcare industry is handling these situations. The easy access to get Narcan for someone, the easy access to get a fentanyl strip for an addict who's not going to, doesn't want to stop and does and, and won't stop. And they know they're getting something that could be deadly, right? So if they're getting a lethal dose of, her- of, of heroin, that's m- most of the time just pure fentanyl by testing it on the strip, at least they know what they're getting. It's inexpensive and it can save a life. I, you know, listen, I'm not going to sit here and I can't tell someone what they're going to put in their body, right? Like that, that's their decision. Whether or not they're an addict or not, if you're your regular Joe Schmo and say, hey, I want to do uh, cocaine this weekend. Well, they're cutting cocaine with fentanyl too. So it's so, e- it's so easy and accessible to get these strips, to test what you're getting. Um, and you know what? Like if you're the, your average person who's hardly ever doing these drugs, there's so many accidental deaths because of it. And can you, uh, let's backtrack a minute here. Can you explain fentanyl and what it is, if and how it's different than cocaine? Because this is, or uh, heroin. This is something that I heard on an interview, I don't know, a year and a half ago, maybe. And I, I just, in my mind, fentanyl is manufactured heroin, basically. Like completely made in a lab with no... My, my, I don't know, surmising is heroin comes from the plant, the opium plant. Fentanyl, I don't think there's a plant. I think it's, it's just manufactured. So that's a great question. I, I, want, I would want to confirm that, but I believe it, it's still categorized as a synthetic opioid. Okay. Um, that's the word I was looking for, synthetic. Yeah. Synthetic opioid, yeah. So same type of, same type of thing as, as an oxy. Uh, what I do know is that fentanyl itself, you know, and this is your basic dosing of it, I guess, is about 80 times stronger than morphine. So that's why there's so many situations with police officers and stuff like that going and it's, and it can be deadly or lethal at the touch of it too. So not just you're, injecting it. Or when you're saying it. 80 times more powerful than morphine, is that morphine synonymous with heroin or is that different? Yeah. Well, and the, again, we, Matt's speaking off the cuff, and I'm trying yeah. to figure out. So, if he or I are wrong on any specific details, it's our intent is pure. Yeah, and I'm and I'm and I'm going to be transparent if I'm if I don't know exactly you know the number. But what I do know is this: I did see when car fentanyl was coming about, which is about I don't know three four years ago, which is another variant of fentanyl. They showed a little picture of of the powder forms deadly forms deadly doses dosages of each drug and you have heroin which is about i'd say a nickel sized okay then you have fentanyl that wasn't even remotely close to i don't know one percent of a penny it was so small and then car fentanyl was like a little grain of salt and so here's the issue right you have addicts who are doing heroin every day intravenously smoking it, snorting it, whatever, regardless of how they're ingesting it, they're still doing it. And so when you have an addict who has a tolerance to a certain amount of heroin, and then the next batch that they get has just a tiny bit more, or if, 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 if at all, just a tiny bit of fentanyl, or maybe they're addicted to fentanyl at this point, And there's just a little added boost of it. The body just doesn't know how to react to that. And that's where these overdose deaths, come into play um because everything is just being cut with it and you had mentioned to me so so i'll kind of condense and and summarize and then if i done accurately then we'll kind of progress forward so Mm -hmm. fentanyl provides a high like heroin um except it's a lot more powerful and people are kind of looking for an extra edge an extra high or more of a high and so that fentanyl is being mixed with both heroin and cocaine. And what that could result in, either way, whether it's a, a drug addict or just a kid in college trying to get high, could result in death. Because it's like, yeah. it's almost like a, you want a coffee and then instead you get like a super on steroids, mega caffeinated, whatever. But the cost of that is death. Cause it can be too much. Correct. And so, uh, you know, 
a speedball is an upper most of the time cocaine and heroin or some sort of upper and downer, but no, normally cocaine and a opioid. Which is the upper, which is the downer? The cocaine is the upper and the opioids are the downer. Okay. Um, so if you have someone who's unknowingly doing a speedball, when they may not ever, ever have done any sort of opiate, they may not even had their wisdom teeth taken out and be given five Vicodin for a day or two. You know what I mean? So when they have no experience, no, um, you know, no knowledge of how powerful some of these drugs are, and they're doing this stuff, like oh, like you know, they, you know, they're they're doing the normal amount of cocaine, so to speak, and then they end up dying because there's fentanyl laced with it. And so that's where it becomes scary. And you know, in, in my opinion, the the average user who maybe just be having beers with their buddies and you know, getting a bag of blow runs the risk of also dying because it's not just the addict who's, you know, banging this stuff in their arms, right? It, it's not, it's the everyday person who, you know, wants to go out in Manhattan or wherever, or some city and get, you know, messed up with their buddies and they run the same exact risk as an addict. And I think I had asked you this last week and I, I don't remember exactly what you said, but you know, a lot of people, certainly not everyone, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of generalizing. You know, a lot of people experiment with drugs and alcohol at a relatively young age, some earlier than others. And like my perception of it is, and then you kind of grow up and priorities, responsibilities, life situations, it takes people in different directions, right? You might have a buddy in college who partied all the time, who's now like Mr. Dad, right? Yeah. Just, just. Ah, I've got over it. Um, this is what I do now. And it's like, holy cow, what a transition. But then some people don't. And then some people continue to recreationally uh, do, you know, uh, drugs and drink, et cetera, and operate fine. It's just, it's just a part of my life. Mm -hmm. Then other people never stop and become addicts. And that's the, the, the place where you were. And as mentioned at the, the introduction here, you had a lot underneath the surface that I'm guessing drove you to that point. But if, if you wouldn't, if your dad wouldn't have passed away in nine 11, who you, who knows where, whether this would have happened or not, I would guess that certainly added to it. But what, what is it like? What, what from your experience, and this is not a research. I'm asking you, Matt, from your experience, what's the determining factor? Like, is it a gene? Do you think, is it environment? Like what, causes some people to nah, I'm done with it and some people to go all in on it that's the thing right i do even if my dad didn't die 9 11 um do i think i would have been a drug addict i don't know i think that uh i w I, I i do think this would have shown up in some way whether it was gambling which i did also struggle with alcohol it, it would have come up at some point in my life that i do believe the other traumatic experiences i went through yeah they played a role but they weren't the actual reason, in my opinion, because now, you know, listen, like I've been sober for about six years. If I were to get high or drunk today, it's my choice that I'm doing that. I've been so far removed from drugs and alcohol that I would be making that choice again. Um, and if I did that, all bets are off. Now, this is 20 years later after 9-11, right? All bets are off if I put that drink or drug in my system. So... Um, we kind of discussed this on the phone, right? But fundamentally you put two people in a room, you put an addict, unknowing addict. Let's, let's say we don't know that this person is an addict. We could presume it though. An addict and a normal person. You give them, let's say Oxy for two weeks straight, both of them, same exact drug. The addict after that two weeks and the normal person are both going to experience the same physical withdrawal symptoms. There's no doubt about that. It, it, there, it's without, there's no doubt. Um, so when you unequivocally know that after two weeks, these people are both going to be physically addicted to this drug physically, where the difference lies is after that drug is now out of their system or they don't have the access to the drug anymore, what happens? Well, the addict is the one who's going to want to go get it. The addict is the one who's mentally addicted now, spiritually addicted now, emotionally addicted, right? Whereas the normal person is going to say, wow, I just took this drug for two weeks. And I'm feeling like absolute shit right now. 
I have to stop taking this drug. The ad is going to say, I want the drug. And that's where the difference lies. And, and that's, in my experience, where you can spot an addict versus a normal person. Because, I mean, th there's no doubt about it. Like you, the body, the human body is only capable of so much. You're putting a, a, a drug into someone's system for two plus weeks at, at a minimum. And I mean, even a week, really. But let's say two weeks. And, uh, you know, the brain is like signaling that you're getting this dope dopamine rush, right? Every single time you're ingesting this drug. And then eventually the brain's like, oh, wait, I need this drug to function now. I need this drug to do my everyday tasks. Like I, I need whatever this is that you're giving me. Don't stop giving it to me. And then you stop and it just all these things start firing off, you know? And, and do you think, do you think that's a, a collection of things or do you think that's a chemical thing? So like if me and you are those two test subjects and we're both giving it, we both get off it. I go this direction. I say, I'm glad that's over. And then you say, I need more of that. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that all of those things the the, the, the mental, the psychological, the spiritual and chemical, or do you lay that more heavily on, it's just a, a, a gene that someone has versus a gene that someone doesn't have, or it's all of those things. Like what's your I think thought? it's a com yeah, I think it's a combination of all of it. I mean, listen, um, I have my thoughts about my personal experience with my own family, whether or not it's genetic for me. Um, I think to a certain degree, yeah, it is. But um, I think that outside effects and traumas and all these other things that we go through certainly play a role too. Um, you know, that being said, not every single kid who lost a dad in 9-11 became a drug addict, right? Not every single kid who lost that 9-11 like was doing what I was doing, right? And I look back now, right? And this is 10, 11, 12 years old, two at the, you know, towards the end of that, two years before I ever picked up a drink and I was already showing and exhibiting addictive personality traits, you know? looking at this, this morbid 9-11 stuff incessantly, right? That's an, ad, that, that's an obsession, that's an addict. And, and the insanity that was kind of intertwined with all of that is like, okay, I'm thinking I'm gonna find something that I'm not gonna find, right? And then when I get this answer that I thought I was looking for, um, and I'm still not finding what I'm looking for, that's the definition of insanity, doing something over and over and over again, expecting a different result. I've thought about this and I've had a, a conversation with my buddy about this. I'm, I'm a, like you're saying, I have addictive personalities for certain things or I'm obsessive mm -hmm. about certain things. And I've thought to myself, boy, with a different combination of factors, I could be in a different place. Like I, 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 I you know, there, there's a thing that I don't really know a lot about, but like the idea of gene activation, right? We have these things inside of us that are dormant and some are activated, some are not with, I mean, I'm obsessive about reading a book. I'm obsessive about asking questions. I'm obsessing about knowing details and repeating. And now with DVR, it drives me crazy. Pause, rewind. What'd he say? Pause, rewind. Wait, what was that word? The pause, put on the uh, closed caption. Now I can see it. Like it's obsessive and it's unnecessary. Yeah. And I, yeah. I think to myself, I'm thankful that I've had the life, the parents, house, school, friends, all of those things because I, with the wrong influence of other things. That's why it's so hard to like judge people because it's all of these factors that contribute and could go in a myriad of directions. Yeah. But here's the thing, right? You know, to kind of play devil's advocate there, right? Like I grew up in a nice house. I grew up in a, with a nice family, nice home besides going through everything with my dad. Right. On the outside, things looked okay. It was a nice town, you know, very white collar town. You wouldn't. And, and that's where I think like, you, you have a point with that thing, the gene activation lying dormant, because the moment I put Adderall into my body, right? And now granted towards the end of addiction, I was not even doing Adderall or anything like that. But the moment I put that into my body, there was something that was, in my opinion, activated. And I think I knew it kind of subconsciously, things were never gonna be the same. I knew it. Some, I felt so good. And it wasn't just the euphoria, euphoria that was with it, you know, it was like this, I felt like whole again, you know, like I had been broken for so long and I felt like repaired all of a sudden. And then when I did oxys for the first time, 
I mean, that was intensified by, I don't know, a hundred times that, you know, like I felt all the pain was a swage. It was gone. Nothing. Felt nothing. And Adderall and Oxy are both very totally uses. different drugs. Okay. Totally different are, drugs. Are they both opi opioids? Or no. Opi okay. Adderall is like, you know, uh, uh, it's a stimulant and, okay. and really fundamentally methamphetamine and, uh, and Oxy is an opiate. Yeah. So totally different drugs, totally different effects on the body, but um, but in some ways the relief that they were both providing me were similar. And and you know sitting here talking to me today, and, and I don't know if the the appropriate word is addict or recovering addict, whichever of those is the correct one or the most appropriate one. You know when you talk about that, and and you think, you know you said that like it was euphoric, everything was gone. It was is it hard for you does thinking about that make it harder for you to stay clean or are you able to compartmentalize it and just take it all in holistically and understand no yeah i mean listen i got sober at 23 years old all right so when i first got sober i still do have friends that drink normally you know they drink uh i talked to one of my friends who was sober at the time and he was like listen like we both got sober young it's something you have to learn how to be around. And if you're in a spiritually fit condition, condition, you can do anything, you know? So for me, like I've been on in the last, you know, few months, like bachelor parties, sober, um, weddings, sober, you know, I've done all these things. And, and I do believe like, if I'm in a good enough spiritual condition, right. If I feel good enough about who I am as a person, um, the fact that I'm content with who I am, I'm content with the fact that I'm in recovery. Like, I don't have to feel shame for that. I don't have to feel embarrassed by that or anything, really. Um, I can do anything. I, I, and I'm around drinking. I've been around people smoking pot. Like, it doesn't affect me. Sometimes it does affect me briefly. Not where I'm tempted, but where I'm, like, more annoyed maybe or aggravated. And I'm like, okay, I want to leave, you know? And then, like, there comes a time when I'm out with friends or something. And, like, you know, maybe they've had a few too many drinks. I'm like, okay, my time here is, is done. You know, it's time for me to go. Um but uh, no, I, I don't think that, um, I, yes, I am able to compartmentalize a lot of this stuff, but at the same time, like um, I'm constantly keeping me, keeping my recovery in check. I mean, this is a daily thing for me. You know, the fact that I have years, I treat it like I have a day, you know, because I see people reaching out, people reach out to me and they're and talking about the struggle. And that just brings me right back to that place. You know, the place where I woke up at two in the morning, three in the morning, the night before I was going to detox taking the same amount of drugs that I have been taking for the past, I don't know, six months that would normally knock me out for about eight, six to eight hours. And my body was shutting down on me. I was already in withdrawal. You know, I was on the brink of a seizure. I knew I had to get to a detox facility and basically just being like, what is going on here? You know, I remember all of that pain. And how important was your environment? I I've read a couple books on, you know, habits and, and behavior change and mm -hmm. the, the, uh, each book, the one called it environment design and the other one called it behavioral architecture. So in getting clean and sober, how important was a change of environment? So one of the examples in the book was there was a video game guy who was addicted to video games. And it was like insane. The amount of it, it was like 15 straight days of in front of the thing, only ordering pizza, never showering, never whatever went to a right. video game rehab facility, which exists. Mm -hmm. thinking he could handle it, went back home, same whatever, house, friends, environment, fell back into it. I've noticed that on a very you know peripheral, simple level that when I go to certain places, for me, it's like food. I, I like dive into junk and eat like garbage because if I walk into X room or X house, ah, that's what I used to do there. How important was that environment manipulation for you in getting clean i definitely play out devil's advocate on this one a lot of the time um it was important and it is important but then then there comes a time where at least in my opinion this is my opinion don't you know you can quote me on this if you want but this is not a recovery program based opinion i think it comes down to the person too you know i got high in New Jersey, New York, and let's, talk, let's, let's branch out in New York. I got high in Harlem, the Bronx, Manhattan, 
you know, from the project houses in Harlem to high rises in Manhattan. There was a complete dichotomy in all the places that I would get fucked up. I didn't care about where I was, where I was, you know, I didn't care about the danger I put myself in. Um, now I get, I go to New Hampshire to a sober house. So four and a half hours away from where mainly I was getting high. Um, now removing myself from the people. Sure. I was still driving the same car, right? I used to get high in that car every day. Um, you know, all these things that like at times, um, would remind me of that life. They were still there. Right. But here's the thing. And this is where I think when someone wants to get sober, right? People know they need to get sober, but they have to desperately want it too. And it's not just about wanting it. It's about, it's a matter of chasing it too, in my opinion. So I get to the sober house and where I was in this small town in New Hampshire, across the street is a bar, 0.25 miles on the road, gas station. And unlike in New Jersey where uh, you can't buy alcohol at a gas station, can get alcohol at the gas station in New Hampshire. Um, diagonal from the phase one house, there's three phases. The, the phase one is the basic, is the first obviously phase. And everyone with like the lowest amount of sobriety is in phase one. Well, diagonal from that house is a crack house. At the meetings, there's people selling dope and fentanyl and whatever. Um, you know, and, and, and you see people going out, right? You see people tempted by it, by it and they go. Now, look, I had, I'd be in a meeting and there would be people nodding out next to me all the time, right? Would I look at them sometimes with disdain or would I look at them sometimes with envy? Yeah, it was a combination at times, right? But I didn't do it. So I think at the end of the day, yeah, people, places, and things certainly play a role. And I think that even temporarily removing yourself from that is important. But there has to be a change, you know, internally. There has to be a change. Otherwise, you know, you can go anywhere in the country. You can go to state-run horrible facilities or your five-star Malibu experience for rehab and come out and still get re and still relapse, right? That's why you, you think people think and associate, oh, I'm spending a hundred grand for my kid to go to this rehab and he's getting high when he gets out. It's not the rehab's fault, mm -hmm. you know? It, it's not. It, it's, it's the fact that or maybe at times it is, but it's, it's most of the time the fact that not enough has been done for that person yet. You know, they're, they're, maybe they're not ready. You know, they haven't surrendered fully. And that's where I think, you know, you could sort of spot at times who wants it badly enough, you know? Yeah, that was a great, and again, why I wanted to talk to you on the show, because you have experience. And I think that's a really solid response. And, you know, as, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking to myself, Charlie, you are kind of making an excuse, right? So when I go to XYZ place, right? So let's just... Uh, simply when I get w w there's a pizza place I love at home right when I go there I know I am getting six pieces of pizza ranch dressing and Pepsi it's because of what I've always well you could it. you could do that I mean look at but, you no but here's the thing thank you but here's the thing it's like that that is for me to say that it is a crutch for me to say well that's where I'm going and I'm gonna do it I'm not dealing with life and death I'm not I'm not potentially gonna die from that pizza when we're talking about drugs, it's much more like the cost is much greater. So were the cost of me eating those six pieces of pizza, the cost of potential death, I wouldn't do it. Like I know I wouldn't do it, but the cost isn't high enough for me to really care about it. So when you're talking about the, the, it being the person I'm playing with, like, you know, nothing over here what you're talking about is life and death. And in that sense, I can see, yeah, I, Charlie, am making excuses about these other things because they're not important enough to me. I don't right. really care. If I'm going you know, home for the weekend, I'm gonna indulge. It's not gonna yeah. affect my life. But what you're talking about, it is gonna affect your life. And that gets to the person. It's like the, uh, if you know the why, then you'll figure out the how. Yeah. Like if you, Matt, bought you, I need to get clean. Yeah. You'll figure out a way whether it's a good facility or not. Right. Right. Well, so like, you know, one example of that, of that like uh, one of my favorite movies is the town Ben Affleck. And um, I know he's in recovery and he produced it too. And, and you could, and there's so many underlying themes of AA in, in that movie. And he goes to a meeting in the movie too, but um, there's, there actually is three, 
three versions of that movie. There's an extended cut, um, which was my favorite because he gets high in the movie, and I'll, I'll explain in a sec. But it, but the extended cut, and then there's an extended cut with a different ending, and then there's the mo- the, the theatrical version. Um, the the movie the the movie that's shown in theaters plus the extended cut they had the same ending and then the uh, the third ending which was also the same as the extended cut okay the content of the extended cut is the same as the third movie except the ending is different mm-hmm. and that ending in may in some ways may be more realistic but is not the ending that everyone the viewers wanted okay anyway the reason why I'm bringing this up in the extended cut version he is an addict and in all the movies he's an addict but he was doing oxys and as an addict i was able to p- pick up on little things that most everyday person isn't going to pick up on terminologies and things like that one scene you know in the beginning he's walking to a meeting and he sees a dealer his old dealer standing outside of this building and the, the guy looks at him and ben affleck looks the other way and, and goes to the aa meeting uh, he can't sleep that n- the night before he wakes up, he's like working out. And then he goes to the meeting, sees the dealer, proceeds to go to the meeting, doesn't go to the dealer. Well, you know, once another scene, uh, he's sitting there with uh, Jeremy Reiner and they're about to pick up like the hundred pounds of weed that they're going to, you know, to clean out the, the stolen money with some like other money. And he's basically telling him, you know, I'm, I'm done. Ben Affleck's like, I'm done with this. I, you know, I'm sick and tired of working with the florist guy, yada, yada, yada. And he's like, and Jeremy's like, well, you didn't really care when you were spending two grand a week on Monsters and Yay or something like that. And Monsters, I took for being oxys because they're, and I know this from my own experience, one of the generic forms by this one company, Mallincroft, has an M on it and they're called M boxes. But Monster is sometimes also a term that was associated with using opiates, especially oxys, because it would make the person scratch. You know, they'd be scratching themselves like a monster or they would turn into a monster. That's really what it is. Like they, they would lash out and turn into a different person. Um, now, playing into this, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because you're saying about, you know, going back home, having the pizza, right? Well, he has this experience where the guys that he's working with threaten him and then they threaten the girl that he's now seeing, who's this innocent woman. I'm sure you've seen the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and after... They threaten her. Ben Affleck pulls up to her place to see what's going on. And the, the florist guys are dropping off a funeral arrangement at her place, right? Insinuating, you know, she could be next, right? So right after that scene, it does this whole like, you know, B-roll footage of Boston, yada, yada, yada. But in the extended version, Ben Affleck now sees that same dealer and is so torn up about what happened with the florist guy plus his interaction with Claire in the next scene. And instead of walking past the guy to go to the meeting, he now goes and picks up the drugs and then proceeds to him getting high in this abandoned train. And he breaks down an OC 80 and crushes it and snorts it. And so all along you're watching the sober guy. And see, that's where I think that movie did a, provided a disservice to the audience because for someone like me seeing that entire movie, that version of the movie, um, was very powerful to me because you see this guy struggling. The disservice was the theatrical version. In some ways I felt like, you know, they censored it too much. You're saying saying, you're saying seeing that the reality of the extended cut is more real to you. Yeah. Because that's the thing, right? Like that, that's where someone in recovery, like I was sort of saying before and alluding to, you have the choice when you're separated enough from the drink or the drug, you have a choice. Right. And I don't want to go on such an A tangent here, but the guy is at a crossroad, right? He is now f- dealing with a tr- uh, traumatic, let's call it, experience in recovery. And whereas before, he wasn't really dealing with traumatic experience, but he had, he still walks past the dealer and goes to the meeting. Now he's like, oh shit, like I'm feeling like crap. I'm going to go to get, get high. You know what I mean? And so he takes that, he makes that choice, right? And so that's where I'm like, so for someone in, in recovery and even maybe someone who wants to be in recovery, that movie can really teach a lesson on some of the stuff. And yeah. granted, it's a whole different thing. It's about, you know, armored car robberies and all that stuff. And I, it's not your traditional story, of course, but the themes are there and they're, under, and, and they're intertwined with the entire story. And, um, and so for me, like watching it now, it's like, wow, like it's like, it's powerful because 
that is what it's about, you know, and, and ultimately he gets clean and, you know, whatever, but, um, you know, it's almost as if like, actually, I don't want to say too much because that's the, that's the third ending. That's, yeah. that's the, the different ending, but his past catches up to him in the end, you yeah. know, and it's as, as much good as he's trying to do, he can't run away from his past and it catches up to him. And it kind of goes back, you know, thinking about, I have not seen that version. Um, yeah, we could talk about it offline too. But thinking about what you're saying and then the fact that I asked you earlier, is it ever hard? And you said, you know, I've been sober six years almost, but it's still a daily thing. The, 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 I think these are my interpretation, but why you appreciate that ending so much plays into the statement of it's a daily thing. And then your realization that, I've got to do this daily. Like someday my mom's going to die. Someday my friend is going to whatever, like bad things are going to happen to you, Matt, as well as every single one of us. And it's at that point that you have your choice as to what you're going to do. And that kind of goes back to, you know, if we're kind of reducing it to, to the, the term you said spiritually fit, I think that's a really solid term. I don't know if that's a, a, a thing that's said or if that's your word or, word or whatever, but but the yeah. more you can be sound as Matt Bocci, the stronger you're going to be with whatever comes your way. Yeah. I, and, you know, this is not a recovery podcast, so I don't want to keep going on that type of tangent. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I just... The impact that drugs have on... Um, I think that, like, stories... I think that version of the town is a perfect story for a lot of, in a lot of ways, because it, a highlights the opioid epidemic, right. And it, it highlights the reality of drug addiction, but it also shows the recovery aspect of it, which isn't always shown in movies. So that's why I found it fascinating. Same thing with the movie flight. I don't know if you've seen that one with Denzel. Yeah. I mean, I know for a fact that one of the producers is in AA. I mean, they had the big book nonstop in that movie. And then it's like the sort of that same thing with Denzel. And it's like, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous are so they're, they're, they're in there in that movie. You know, he's about to get away with the fact that he was messed up while he was flying that plane. Although he saved the whole entire, you know, flight, except for the couple of people that died. Um, he saved all the innocent people. Right. And then the fact that that woman that he was seeing died and he was living with the fact that he kind of put it all on her he ends up get, coming clean about it. He's about to get away with it. And then he comes clean, you know, and it's like, that's like what it is, right? For me, I had to come forward about the things that I did. You know, I had to make amends to people that I did things to, that I stole from, you know, lied to, cheated, whatever. And I had to come forward about things that I kept secret for so many years, you know, and that's the hard part of recovery, you know? And all these things Matt's talking about to mention your book again he goes into detail that again that that's what made the book oh my gosh oh my gosh oh my gosh like the the basically full frontal approach that you gave in sharing all that stuff and then having talked to you and realized holy smokes this guy lived through that stuff and is who he is today and like it i yeah. had a, a girl on my show named cheryl and she's 20 and she attempted suicide two times and and her story is one of resilience and, and perseverance and i'm talking to her and she's 20 and yeah. i'm thinking oh my gosh like you're a sound human right you're, you're spiritually fit like it, it's it's inspiring for me to hear these stories and be able to share these stories because to touch on what you're talking about that version of of the town that you liked and what you just said there it's like it's messy and and life is messy whether you're talking about recovery or whether you're talking about life in general it's messy and it's not always pretty and i think that the reality of that it's why you connect you listener you matt you me it's why you connect with someone who's honest right mm -hmm. because it's, it's not like no story is a perfect story and the more that it's portrayed in a real way the entertain the, the entertainment value the box office might not be as much but yeah. for someone like you who's really talking about serious stuff you don't care about the box office right like you want yeah. something that's going to connect with you yeah absolutely so we're we're about at about an hour right now but but to kind of yeah and we went on so many tangents here sorry about that no i love this exactly what i was hoping i hope the audience enjoys it but it's it, the the um so i was i'm reading a book called skip the line by james altucher 
and he's a yeah. pretty popular guy, pretty successful author and, and person. But uh, he was talking about frames and like, you know, framing of a conversation and, and kind of like uh, not necessarily leader follower, but like expert student, not, I mean, that's a generalized explanation mm. of what he's saying. But when you started talking to me about drugs on the phone, it was like you were a different person. Like you were there, man. Like it, yeah. I, I looked at you as I'm going to shut my mouth and I'm going to listen because mm -hmm. you, you're, you've been there and you've done it and you know it. You know it. And that to me was what I was most intrigued about and why I wanted to record this conversation and what I hope the audience takes from it. So to think that you went in tangents, I don't, I don't think that at all. I think... This is a guy who's been there and has a story to tell, experiences to share that literally can and will and are saving lives. Yeah. That's, that, that's, uh, that, that's as valuable as anything. Right on, man. Well, I mean, I'm happy to come back again and go more detail with drugs. And I know you're like, yeah, so your first experience with like drugs, I'm like Adderall. And then boom, it's like a hundred yeah. tangents. But I but mean, no. this is like, this is the reality. I get passionate about this stuff and into it. And I think I, 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 I would actually, I think we should do this in a, in a little while, a, another episode to talk about recovery, like yeah. recovery, the, 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 the process of it, the day to day, the daily practices, the importance of X, Y, and Z. I think that would be extremely helpful as well. Right on. Yeah. I mean, I'm happy. We can do a two piece series if you want with it too. I mean, I'm yeah. happy to talk more detailed about, you know, the drugs I did or more experiences on that. And then you know, wrap it, you know, tie in uh, all the recovery stuff too. Yeah, for sure. So kind of share what, what you're doing, the direction you're going in, because after our initial conversation, you and I talked about speaking and it's a hell of a year to get into yeah. speaking with freaking yeah, yeah. COVID, but uh, well, just how you're sharing your message to whom you're sharing it, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, listen, like I'm very vulnerable as a guy and, uh, and you are too, but I, I have to be, I have to get out of this mindset of like, you know, worrying you know i worry a lot and um so anyway i you know my, my paperback version is coming out this fall uh, of sway and so i'm gearing up for that um you know i have been doing the speaking stuff prior to COVID, but not really getting paid for it whatever and like and when all, literally my entire career what i envisioned for myself to be doing has literally happened in COVID, and so i've been faced with a million different obstacles and hurdles in order to like continue to make this you know dream come true um but it's slowly but surely coming together. Um, so, yeah, I mean, paperback's coming out in the fall, and uh, I'm I'm excited for that. And hopefully, more people will hear my story, and you know, I think see the long lasting impact that 9/11 had on my life, and also many other 9/11 children, because that's what the goal is, right? Um, but with speaking and telling my story, I mean, I've sort of said this with you and other people, like my whole goal. I don't tell my story candidly for sympathy. You know, I don't want to garner sympathy from people. Like I went through what I went through and that's that, right? Um, why I do it though, is because for someone who's, so for me to go in front of like a bunch of high school kids, right? And they're looking at someone like me, they may be like, oh, like this guy, you know, he's a young adult, like seemingly put together or whatever. They're not going to be like, this guy's going to tell us that he was sexually abused by a man. You know what I mean? They're not going to tell us that he just, you know, that he was, uh, that he did heroin or something like that. You know what I mean? Like they're not going to be thinking that when they look at me now. So the fact of the matter is by being so open and vulnerable with these kids, um, I can ideally help one of them. And if I help one of them, then my job there was done. You know, if I help multiple kids, great, you know, but if someone can reach out and say, listen, like, you know, I, I'm struggling, you know, thank you for what you did. Like you provided me some inspiration or something where someone thinks of me next time they're offered a pill or a drink or a line and they don't want to do it, you know, and they say no. And they actually say, no, I'm good. They don't give in to peer pressure. Right. And I did something right. And so that's what the goal is all along, you know, is to help someone along the way because I was helped along the way and I'm grateful to the people who helped me. But, um, you know, the fact is, yeah, my story has some difficult topics in it and uh, material, but um, ultimately I came out on the other side alive, somewhat thriving. And, you know, I've used, I think in a lot of ways, my dad's, my dad's fight for the better, you know, that, that's the type of person my dad was. He never gave up on anything. 
you know, and um, that was it. You know, I, I, I always find myself like I fall down, I pick myself back up, you know, and that's that's what it is. Well, it's been awesome, buddy. And, and uh, again, his book is Sway, S-W-A-Y. It's on Amazon. It, uh, f- such a good book. I, I highlight a lot, but I pretty much highlight the whole book. So it's actually cool <laughs> to, to get you on and, and to talk. And, you know, you are doing, you are fighting a good fight and a worthy fight. And one that's like grounded, like you're, you're it's, it's so uh, real and integritous that it's, it's, that makes it all the better. But I, I definitely would like to have you back on. We can talk about recovery. Um, yeah. And even some of the, the speaking experience, the interactions with kids, grown ups, because it's not yeah. just a kid story. It's it's there's a lot of grown ups out there too. But it's been awesome, man, and, and I appreciate yeah. you appreciate you coming here and taking time out. How's the weather down there in Jersey? Yeah, and before I forget to say this, you know, like uh I really I, I refer to you to other people and I consider you a mentor and you've certainly been that for me, you know, like you have helped me more than you know. Um, just to let you know that. But uh, the weather down here is, is pretty good today. Uh, I uh, I have some some more work I got to finish up and do some reading, then go body surfing in like a couple hours and get tan for a little bit, and then come back and get back to the grind. Nice. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm I'm thank you by the way for what you said, but I'm in Pennsylvania outside of Hershey, and it's like advisor crazy advisory heat level. Um, yeah. 100 plus 100 i feel like the whatever heat factor was like 110 or something so it, yeah. it is um really stinking hot here but we yeah. don't have a beach outside so. <laughs> well it's not as hot here surprisingly actually you know where my mom lives it's uh it's it's cooler or she's up north right now it's cooler here there than it is here so i mean um i guess that's one bonus of it but yeah it always clears my mind being down by the beach absolutely buddy all right matt thanks man No problem. Thank you.